My buddy Will was a Green Beret captain. He was wounded in Aruzgan province, Afghanistan in a firefight. And he stepped on a landmine, was thrown up into the air. Both of his legs were blown off above the knee. He landed on the ground. His team scrambled to save his life, called in a medevac helicopter. They put him on the aircraft knowing that time was short. The helicopter flew so hard to get Will back to a higher level of care that people on the ground waiting to receive Will said that parts were falling off of the helicopter as it approached the landing strip. The pilots were redlining it so hard. Think about that for a second. When Will landed, they immediately triaged him and they moved him to Charlie Med in Kandahar where a reservist uh, Navy officer who was an anesthesiologist, was one of the first ones with Will, and he, they, they sedated him and they put him into emergency surgery. He almost died on the table several times. I was outside waiting on any kind of news from Will. He was one of our guys, and when the surgeon came out, he said, and he was emotional, he said, that's the strongest man I've ever seen. He fought, and we nearly lost him on the table multiple times. He said, did you know he was a baseball player? I said, I did know he was a baseball player. Um, he said, um, I said, he played in college. He said, that's right. And he goes, when he gets better and he's able to walk, I want you to give him this. And it was a note. And I carried that note for several months until Will got back to San Antonio, Texas, was fitted for prosthetics. And I got home from my deployment. You can't coach that. You can't make that up. And... Um, I read the note finally that the doc had given me and it said, Will, when you're able to walk, I'd like you to join me at the College World Series. I have seats for you. So I, I got that note to Will. He was very emotional, as you can imagine. He had just learned how to walk on his prosthetics. Guess who threw out the opening pitch at the College World Series standing on the mound? That young Captain Will. And he went on to uh, marry again. He's had a child. He got his MBA from Rice University, and now he's a leader uh, at a very prolific Fortune 100 corporation in Texas, and he still leads at a community level. And through all of this, Will has maintained his humility, and if you ask him what he's learned, he'll just say, never give up no matter what life throws at you. Now, that's a story that I love to tell. It's a story that I tell at veterans' events for storytelling work, and it's a story that I tell whenever I introduce Will and he's about to speak somewhere. And even though I haven't seen Will in a while, that story still remains true to me. And I, there are millions of stories like that of warriors and people who have fought through. But if you listen to that story, my sense is that you probably found a connection in that story somewhere. Something in that story landed on you, landed on your chest cavity, and you felt an emotional connection to that story. Maybe you got a sense of yourself in that story. Maybe in some element of struggle, you thought about your journey or the journey of a friend or you just empathized with Will and you wanted to meet him. That is the power of story. That is what story offers us from a strategic communications perspective. But if I had shown or told you that story using PowerPoint and just raw data, would it have been the same? I don't think it would have. I don't think it would have landed with you. I don't think it would add meaning and memory like stories do unlike any other tool in the world. So what is it about story that makes it so powerful? In this month of July, we're focusing on narrative competence part one. And before I get you on your feet and start having you develop your story, I wanna talk about what is it that must be in a story. Now I pulled these from the book, Story Smart, Kendall Haven, but I'm also pulling them from the Storyteller Secret, Carmine Gallo. I've taken multiple courses on storytelling from Donald Miller, Michael Haig, Bo Eason. This is a synthesis of it, and these are five. They're not the only five, but they are five essential elements of a story. So whether you're telling a joke to your friends that you really want to laugh, or whether you're doing a sales pitch to a customer, or you want a donor to take action for your nonprofit, or you want your child to listen to the rules you're laying down, if you're going to use a story to con connect with them, then what I'm going to ask you to do are to consider these five essential elements. The first element is character. 
right? We've got to have a character we can relate to. In this case, it was Will. Will was the hero in what we call the hero's journey. Now, Will would be very upset if I called him a hero, even though in my eyes he is. The hero in this sense is simply the protagonist, the main character, someone we can relate to. And we need to know enough about them that we can connect with them. Remember I told you that Will was a captain in special forces, and I told you a few things about him in the beginning. The next thing is the character has to have a goal, right? The character has to have a goal. In this case, the character's goal was to survive, was to win, was to come home and live again, right? And even though I didn't state that, you garnered that, just you inferred that from the ways that he fought on the table, right? The ways that he fought to stay alive. Right? Even the fact that he played college baseball and he fought for his life on the table. Right? And, and, he, and he went and threw the pitch out. At the, you were able to infer the goal of staying alive and living a higher life. There has to be an enemy or an obstacle between the character and her goal. Right? There has to be what we call conflict or tension. Right? Even, in a, even in a joke, right? there needs to be an obstacle that places itself. In this case, there were several, weren't there? Right? There was the obstacle of Will losing his legs and bleeding out and dying. That was obviously an obstacle. But there was also the obstacle of recovery, of dealing with these new prostheses and this new life. It would have been much easier to just quit and give up. Right? So we've got to describe the obstacles and create tension or conflict in the story. There also has to be struggle in the story. Right? There has to be struggle. We find characters relatable based on struggle. Why? because we're all creatures of struggle. We all battle and grind through our life and we can only follow and relate to those who have struggled. And that's why storytellers who have the willingness to share their struggles, not in a therapy kind of way, but in the service of others, I call that the generosity of scars. And it's one of the greatest leadership attributes on the planet. And it's what makes you relatable in the eyes of others that drops all kinds of tensions and gaps from ethnicity, to religion, to struggle, or excuse me, to socioeconomic status, gender, struggle, and one's journey through struggle is what makes you relatable. And it is essential in a well-told story if you're going to connect with people. And finally, resolution, right? What happens? It doesn't have to be a happy ending, and in many cases it wasn't. I mean, Will did lose his legs. His first marriage didn't succeed. He got married again. He had a child. There was resolution. Will changed. And the hero, in this sense, what makes, it's not, you know, it's not how one shows up in the story as a hero, right? It's not LeBron James at the beginning, look how great I am, or Rocky dancing around the ring beating Apollo Creed. We don't get to see that win until the end, right? It's the resolution, the journey that the hero must go through, and the way the needle moves through change that makes the story compelling. How did you change? What did you learn? What did you learn about yourself? What did you learn about the world? How was the story resolved? This is what people crave to know. This is how we learned around this campfire 100,000 years ago where Wes off camera, right, is sitting by me and I stagger in all bloody and I say, Wes, let me tell you why saber-toothed tigers make crappy pets. West is going to lean in and listen because he needs resolution on that so that he can locate himself in the story and not make that same mistake. It's a sense-making tool. There is a make-sense mandate, according to Kendall Haven, that is in every listener. And if you include in your story these five elements and the delivery skills that you're going to learn from me going forward, People will meet you on the rooftop. People will climb up ladders into the darkness and they will follow you, not because they have to, but because they choose to, right? There's more to story than this, but this is a good start. And if you really want to dive into it, I hope that you'll join us in our Rooftop Leadership Mastery Tribe. Rooftopleadership.com forward slash mastery for about what it takes to eat out once a month with your family, about 50 bucks a month. The first month is free. You can come in and in, you know, in your own home, on the road, using your mobile device, have access to a rooftop university where you can do self-study on thousands of topics, where you have a private team room of other like-minded leaders making a difference bigger than themselves on the Facebook page, and where you get monthly calls with me on these types of topics in real time. And I challenge you to find that kind of membership mastery anywhere for that price point. And 
Talk to the people who are already in there. They're getting better. Their lives are changing as a result of this. And we're not even into story yet. We're not even into narrative competence yet. Wait till we turn that beast loose. Be part of this movement. Be part of this tribe. Join us on the rooftop. Thanks for what you do.